Thank you, Mary. Today, I'm going to talk about some new, uh, or rather the most up-to-date recommendations from the American Heart Association. There's been a recent update that's actually very exciting that I'm going to talk about. Um, but I'm also going to go over some things that have been known from before. Uh, Mary, if you could give me the next slide. Uh, my source for today's talk is two papers put out by the American Heart Association. The first was in 2013, which is their latest um, guidelines for the acute management of stroke. And the second source is just in this past summer, they put out a focused update dealing just with the specific uh, issue of uh, endovascular treatment of stroke. So everything I tell you today, especially if it's highlighted, is going to be from uh, the American Heart Association. Uh, next slide. There. What I'm going to talk about is first um, blood pressure management acutely in stroke. And secondly, uh, a few issues about acute medical therapy of stroke. These issues have not changed since 2013, so I'm just reviewing um, what the American Heart Association has been saying about treatment of blood pressure and stroke and medical treatment for stroke. These are the, the latest guidelines, though, but dating from 2013. The third thing I'm going to talk about is the new issue which is endovascular treatment acutely in stroke. It's actually a very exciting time in stroke management right now because just in the last year there have been um, a lot of data published showing the benefit for endovascular treatment. So I'm going to, you know, make you sit through the first two things which are just kind of a review before we get to the exciting stuff. The first two things, though, I'm going over because they are really important for everyone who has a stroke. The third is going to be a um, just a subset of patients who show up, you know, within an hour or so of stroke uh, symptom onset, and will not be applicable to everybody. Uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of the first thing. If I could have the next slide. First thing is blood pressure management. Um, one thing we've noticed is that blood pressure is often elevated in people when they have a stroke. It can be quite high. The systolic blood pressure can be over 200. And there is uncertainty about what's the best thing to do. If I could have the next slide. There are risks if someone's blood pressure is very high acutely in a stroke. One risk is that it might provoke more strokes, either expansion of the stroke or a separate stroke happening. We know that spikes of blood pressure put people at risk for strokes. A second risk is that high blood pressure promotes swelling of tissue. It promotes edema within the brain. And for someone who has a large stroke, that could be a very important, uh, a very important problem could lead to significant neurological worsening, and high blood pressure might promote that. And finally, if someone has any bleeding within a stroke, whether it was a primary hemorrhage that caused the stroke or whether someone has a ischemic stroke that then has some secondary bleeding, if the blood pressure is really high, it could promote further bleeding. These are risks associated with um, really high blood pressure. The next slide. On the other hand, there is a potential benefit to elevated blood pressure in someone who's just had a stroke. Normally, the brain is very good at regulating perfusion in the tissue. And whether your blood pressure is very high or very low, you have a constant stream of blood going through the tissue. This is upset during the stroke. And perfusion in the tissue becomes more directly um, uh, related to how high the blood pressure is. And there's a thought 
that the brain actually needs an elevated blood pressure acutely during stroke in order to uh, prevent under perfusion of the tissue. There's still uncertainty about how much of this benefit of elevated blood pressure weighs against the risks. Can I have the next slide? Um, that is to say, whether if we use medication to purposefully lower um, blood pressure, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, except in the case of acute thrombolysis, where we know that a really, if someone gets uh, a TPA in the emergency department, we know that their risk of bleeding is much higher if the pressure is high. So in that one case, we know it's, you have to bring the pressure down. But in most people who come with a stroke and their blood pressure is over 200, if you use blood pressure medications to bring it down, is that good or bad? Can we have the next slide? <coughs> and there is no data from any randomized clinical trial that has specifically looked at that question. Next slide. However, in several trials that have been done, looking at certain neuroprotective drugs. Uh, this is dating back 20 years. Um, it was noted that in patients who were treated with a neuroprotective agent, if it made their blood pressure go down, those people got worse. Um, for example, uh, one, of the neuro one concept of neuroprotection was to use calcium channel blockers. It was thought that excess calcium during the stroke would lead to further neuronal damage and so they gave people calcium channel blockers, things like verapamil, nimotapine. And we know those are blood pressure agents. They lower the blood pressure. Not only was the trial using verapamil a negative trial, that is, verapamil did not uh, improve people uh, who had a stroke, they found that those people who got verapamil and their blood pressure went down actually did worse. Can we have the next slide? So because of that experience in which it was noted that treating someone with a drug that lowers their blood pressure actually made them worse, the um, current recommendation from the American Heart Association is not to give any blood pressure medication to someone when they come in with a stroke unless their systolic blood pressure is crazy out of control. More than 220 uh, millimeters systolic or 120 millimeters diastolic. It's sometimes scary to have a patient that you're caring for whose blood pressure is 210 over 100 and to be told or to think I'm not going to give them any blood pressure meds. But that is the current recommendation. Part of what goes behind that recommendation is the fact that 80, 90 percent of stroke patients who have this kind of blood pressure, 200 or so, have it reduced within the next 24 to 36 hours anyway, even if you don't do anything. So the current recommendation is just, you know, if uh, all other things being equal, leave those patients alone. Do not try to lower their blood pressure on purpose because that might make them worse and they're probably going to, the blood pressure is going to go down on its own anyway. If you do want to lower someone's blood pressure because their systolic blood pressure is, say, 240, the recommendation is very similar to the recommendation given in the case of anybody with um, uh, uh, emergent hypertension, a, a hypertensive crisis. Um, the goal would be to lower blood pressure by, say, 15% during the first day or so. Uh, that is correct. This is the guideline for people who are not being considered for acute thrombolysis. For people being considered for acute thrombolysis, we want to keep the systolic blood pressure under 180, 180 or so. Um, next slide. The guideline goes on to say that restarting blood pressure medications after a day or so is a reasonable thing to do. You can go ahead and do that. Um, 
contraindications, right? The, the, the statement, unless there's a specific contraindication, which you would think would be understood, but they put it in there anyway for you, that, you know, if it seems like the right thing to do in a particular patient, let's say that after 24 or 36 hours, their blood pressure is still 210, then you can start uh, oral hypertensive agent, um, restart their tenolol or lisinopril or whatever, and have their blood pressure slowly come down again. Um, next slide. Um, and on the other hand, if someone comes in and has a low blood pressure, say they're 90 over 60, for example, it's generally agreed that you should find out why they have the low blood pressure. If they're hypovolemic, you should replace that. Um, this is different from, you know, purposefully raising someone's blood pressure just to try and um, affect the outcome of a stroke. If someone comes in and they seem to be hypovolemic, treat that, is what this guideline is saying. Can I have the next slide? Any questions about blood pressure treatment for most people who come in with a stroke who do not get thrombolysis? Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about are the most current recommendations for medically treating people with stroke. Uh, there's, you know, acute thrombolysis, but besides that, what have we got? Um, and I kind of put here a question for anticoagulation and a question for antiplatelet agents. So what is the recommendations for medical therapy? If I can have the next slide. The chance of having a recurrent stroke is less than that. So that actually the chances of having an adverse reaction to intravenous heparin is less than any benefit you might get from it, and that's why it's not recommended. Occasionally, there's a decision to use it anyway in certain specific situations. If someone has a thrombus in the basilar artery and it's thought to be very dangerous, they could slip into a coma at any minute. There is no other treatment available. Doctors will often, uh, in a uh, desperate attempt to do something, would put the patient on intravenous heparin. But when they do so, they're doing so not with any guideline from the American Heart Association. Can I have the next slide? Because now we're getting to the real update, something that's just in the last few months. Um, the rest of this is, um, uh, the rest of this comes from the paper that came out in June. It was actually published ahead of print in June, so I'm not sure if it's out officially in the journal yet. And it's concerning endovascular treatment, that is catheter-based treatment acutely in stroke. And just a little bit of background, between 2002 and 2015, there were eight trials of using catheter-based treatment for stroke. The initial ones, the first three, as it turns out, mostly used intraarterial TPA, or what we would now call first-generation uh, uh, clot retrieval devices, like the Mercy device. The other five trials that came a little bit later used what are called stent retrieval devices. A stent retrieval, I don't know if you know uh, what a stent looks like, you know, a cardiac stent, as opposed to the Mercy device, which is like a corkscrew. So a stent retrieval device is basically a stent that you can then pull out. The idea is it's a temporary stent. It becomes enmeshed in the clot and retrieves the clot with it. It is gentler on the arteries. It is more likely to grab the entire clot than the other devices that were used at first. And so it's, uh, it's an advance upon the early uh, catheter-based um, devices to, pull a, to actually pull a clot out of an artery. All of these, of course, suppose that someone has a clot sitting in an artery. This treatment is for people who have a stroke, 
can be treated within the first few hours and in the major artery of the brain have a clot sitting there that we want to move out of the way. If I can have the next slide. The first three trials, and I put the names up here just so you could, you know, impress your friends, um, was uh, the synthesis expansion, Mr. Rescue, and IMS-3. If you add up all of these trials, there were 1,100 patients that were enrolled in all three studies. None of them individually or collectively, if you, could, if you pool the data, none of the trials had showed any benefit for endovascular therapy. So these were negative trials. Um, when they measured the reperfusion rate, and what I mean by that is um, initially there's a clot sitting in the artery and you look beyond it and there's no perfusion. How many times were they able to pull the clot out and then you can see blood flow through the artery? How many times could they reestablish exclusion, uh, reestablish blood flow? And they achieved reperfusion rates of between, let's say, 25 and 40 percent, which is not much better than IV thrombolysis, which is about 20, 25 to 30 percent. So it's not surprising that these early trials showed no benefit. These trials were reported like uh, 2012, 2013. I could have the next slide. The five trials that were done with a stent retrieval device, uh, I've shown up here. The first one to be reported was called Mr. Clean or MR Clean. Uh, if you add up these five trials, it's a total of uh, over 1,200 patients. All of these trials showed a benefit for endovascular therapy. The first one to be reported was the Mr. Clean trial. That The data from that trial was reported in December 2014. Um, some of the, the other trials were reported anywhere from like immediately after that to around June or so. In fact, um, the Ravis Cat trial, the last one listed, I don't, it's not, that's been reported at a meeting and some of the data was made available, but I don't think they've actually come out with their paper yet. So this is very new data. Um, the last two trials I have up here, what happened is after the initial um, um, publication of Mr. Clean, they decided to look at their data and they did a, an early analysis and they realized that the benefit was so good, they could stop the trials early. Two of these, the, these last two trials were actually stopped early because it was clear that there was benefit. They didn't have to continue the trial. The data, it was already, it was already statistically significant that there was a going to be a, a better outcome. Um, you'll notice I, I put here one of the um, outcome results that they were looking at is how many patients are independent three months after their stroke. And if you look at all the, it varied between the, the, um, uh, the five trials, but in all of the trials, the number of people who were independent at three months was significantly greater, was about 70% greater than in the control group. So in the treatment groups of all the trials, about 50% were independent compared to about 30% who were in, who, in the control group, who did not get the endovascular treatment. When they looked at the reperfusion rates of doing the endovascular treatment with the stent retrieval system, they had between 60 and 90 percent rates of reestablishing perfusion. So the obvious explanation, and the explanation that people think why this treatment is working so well is that the stent device 
so good at being able to grab a clot and pull it out, right? They get reperfusion rates of 60 to 90 percent, and that's why people have a better outcome, because we reestablish blood flow. Just to give you some perspective, in the trials that they did just on intravenous um, TPA alone, the reperfusion rate is about 30 or 35 percent. It turns out that um, all of these trials were uh, had some common characteristics, and that kind of led to the way that the American Heart Association was recommending people get treated. One thing is, in all of these trials, the vast majority of people had already been treated with IV TPA. They were not enrolled in the trial, or the, they were enrolled in the trial from having had the standard therapy, which is IV TPA. And there were some other characteristics that were common and you'll see that on a slide that's coming up. Um, so I hope it's clear that we had randomized control trials. People were entered who had already been treated with IV TPA, and then they either got, uh, they were in the control group or they were in an endovascular group where they got treated. So in the control group, about 30% were independent at three months, which um, actually agrees with um, the IV TPA trials that have been done in the past. Most trials on IV TPA, a control group that is someone who got nothing, had about 20% chance of being independent at uh, three months, versus people who were treated with intravenous TPA had a chance of about 30, 35% of being independent. So clearly IV TPA is better than nothing. People who get nothing in the early trials just looking at your intravenous thrombolysis. Control groups had like 20% rate of being independent. People who got IV TPA were about 35% chance of being independent. And that 35% that about matches, it about matches the 30% that they got in this trial, because most of these patients had already been treated with IV TPA, so that makes sense. But the patients in these trials who also got endovascular treatment were about 50% of them were independent. Okay, the next slide. The American Heart Association, although uh, the FDA has not approved these therapies yet, the American Heart Association has said they recommend endovascular treatment with a stent retrieval if people meet certain criteria. And that's the next slide. And all of these criteria are things that match the people who were entered into the trials. The first criteria is that they have a pre-stroke modified Rankin scale of 0 or 1, which means they were not disabled before the stroke. The modified Rankin scale, the higher your score, the more disabled you were. So people who were completely symptom-free or maybe had some symptoms, if someone was like that before their stroke, they're a candidate. The second criterion is if they were treated with IV thrombolysis according to protocol. The reason they put that in there is because in the trials that everybody was. And third, there has to be a clot for the stent retriever to retrieve. So there has to be an occlusion in the internal carotid artery or the proximal middle cerebral artery. At least age 18, because none of these studies uh, yeah, none of these treatments have been studied in a pediatric population. Intravenous thrombolysis has not been studied under age 18, none of these things. So there are no guidelines for treating pediatric stroke. All of the people who were entered into the studies had an NIH stroke scale of at least six. So that was incorporated into the recommendation. There's a thing called an aspect score. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a, it's a way of scoring how big a stroke is on a CAT scan. It turns out you can, you can divide a CAT scan into 10 um, sort of quadrants, I suppose. When you're looking at the initial CAT scan that's done in the emergency room, you can divide up the whole cortex and the basal ganglia into like 10 sections. 
and you mark whether it appears on the CAT scan that that section is um, uh, involved in the stroke or not. The score of 10 would mean that none of the uh, areas are involved in the stroke. You don't see any stroke at all. So if someone gets a 10 because all of the areas are normal. And the score of 0 would mean that someone has a stroke involving the entire hemisphere and all of the sections are uh, appear as a stroke, and that would be like a devastating stroke. So, a relatively small stroke appearing on CAT scan. So, it's not a contraindication to see stroke at all on a CAT scan, but it cannot be a large area. And finally, treatment has to be started within six hours. There actually are data in one of the trials, in the Mr. Clean trial, they actually had data that showed that it didn't work, or the benefit went way down beyond six hours. So if I could have the next slide. So the first thing is, they say patients should receive IV TPA, even if they're going to be considered for endovascular treatment, because IVTPA is the FDA-approved treatment for acute stroke. If someone shows up within three hours and you can treat them with intravenous TPA, even if you think this is someone you're going to send for uh, catheter-based treatment, you should treat them. Next slide. They found, when they look at the data from these trials, that you don't have to observe patients after they get IV TPA to see whether or not they're going to get better. You can just treat them and then immediately uh, proceed to, to catheter-based therapy. You don't have to like wait half an hour to see did the IV TPA work. Just give it to them and then immediately send them and consider giving uh, the catheter-based treatment. So you'll know, you'll, if you remember, a couple of slides back, I said one of the criteria for considering endovascular treatment is that someone has gotten TPA already, the intravenous TPA. This is kind of an explanation for why that is. Um, um, if someone has a contraindication to intravenous TPA, like uh, a recent stroke or some coagulopathy. We don't have any data on if those patients getting endovascular treatment, how safe it is. Because all of those studies had patients who were already treated with intravenous TPA, and so by definition they didn't have any contraindication to intravenous TPA. So if you have a patient coming in with an acute stroke and you know that they have a big clot sitting in the middle cerebral artery, but they have a um, <coughs> uh, an INR of 2.4, they're not going to get intravenous TPA. We don't know how safe it is to stick that stent retriever up there and try and retrieve the clot. It's reasonable to try it because when they do stent retrieval, they're not injecting any um, uh, blood thinner. They're not injecting any uh, heparin or uh, giving TPA or anything. And you think, well, uh, just sticking the thing up in there and grabbing the clot should be relatively safe, even though they're anticoagulated. But we don't actually know that. There's very little data about that. So in carefully selected patients, if you really think they would benefit from uh, TPA, you could consider it. And the next slide selected patients with anterior circulation occlusion. And by anterior, they mean uh, internal carotid or middle cerebral artery. Now we can we go back two slides, or back forward two slides to where we were. That one. Because there are very few patients who had vertebral artery occlusion or basilar artery occlusion, the American Heart Association is saying we're not going to recommend it for those patients because the studies didn't study those patients and we don't know. Most physicians will decide to treat these patients. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that 
clot retrieval worked very well for patients who have uh, basilar artery occlusion. Uh, I personally have seen four miraculous cases in my career of patients who come in with a coma, but then after uh, the clot was removed from the basilar artery, they woke up and had minimal deficit. It's much less common than clots going to the middle cerebral artery. There are fewer patients and fewer patient data to base things on, but I think most physicians would agree that if someone has a basilar artery clot, the prognosis is otherwise pretty bad if it's not treated. That I think most physicians are going to go ahead and go beyond the American Heart Association recommendation in this area, but that's that's a prediction that the actual guideline does not recommend it for patients with vertebral basal occlusion, although it says it would be a reasonable thing. Can I have the next one? So they go ahead and say this should be pretty obvious. The stent retrieval is recommended over the Mercy device. So there was a lot of excitement about the Mercy device when it came out, but it, its future looks pretty bleak now because it's, uh, it's obsolete. Um, and using a stent retriever is recommended over just using intra-arterial TPA. So because one way of treating a clot is just to bring a catheter up to the clot and inject it with TPA, but that's also obsolete at this point. If I can have the next slide. Um, I cut a lot out of this recommendation. It was very wordy. Um, <coughs> I still, I still had to make the the font smaller. So something I haven't mentioned, but it seems pretty clear, is if you, you have to demonstrate that someone has a clot in the middle cerebral artery if you're going to do endovascular treatment. And especially for us here in a community hospital, for example, before we ship someone into Boston where they do that kind of treatment, we would want to demonstrate there's actually a clot there and it's worth med flighting them or sending them down by ambulance. And practically speaking, the way to do that is a CT angiogram. And in fact, in their guidelines, it says a non-invasive intracranial vascular study is strongly recommended. That is, practically speaking, the CT angiogram. So if someone comes in, they're getting IV TPA, and you think they could get endovascular treatment, you should get a CT angiogram. Getting the CT angiogram should not delay intravenous TPA. So you don't want to you don't want to like take time to set things up or whatever. If someone's a candidate for intravenous TPA, just do it because you don't need a CT angiogram to do that. Um, initiating intravenous TPA before imaging is then recommended. So just, just do the TPA and then consider getting a CT angiogram. Uh, so what they, yeah, that's the last two points, the last two bullets in this slide is basically get the TPA as quickly as you can because that's that's the, uh, that's the accepted treatment. And then get a CTA as quickly as you can after that and see if the patient is a candidate to then go on and get endovascular treatment. Um, and the next slide. So I'm going to sort of restate some things to wrap up the talk, give you some conclusions. Any questions about the endovascular treatment? Leahy Clinic does it. This, uh, and that's it. That's the closest thing. And so mostly it's going to be because um, because of lines of communication from our hospital, it will probably be Boston. We have been sending people down to do it, yes. Now we'll be sending more. So just to sum up from my talk, um, the first point about blood pressure was that lowering blood pressure with, not medica with medication is not recommended for most stroke patients. Secondly, anticoagulation, that is intravenous heparin, is not recommended acutely in stroke. 
And then uh, third, the next slide. Endovascular treatment should be considered for patients being treated with intravenous TPA. A CT angiogram should be done as soon as practical, as long as it does not delay the accepted treatment with intravenous TPA. And there's no need to wait and see if a patient's improving. If someone is getting TPA, they have a, and you know that they have a, an acceptable clot, you don't have to like say, well, we'll wait an hour and then ship them. Uh, just send them down and uh, have them get the therapy, and that's, that is the recommendation. I think that's it. Can I, is there another slide? 